Yeah, which one of you are going to start? Okay. Uh, I will, I'm just going to hand it over right. <laughs> to Renee no, and I Irene. We're, first of all, um, uh, we're very grateful to be here. Um, I think the first thing to say um, is to thank the translators. In our case, we, we will, uh, you know, our, we have notes, and um, some of them were not so easy to transcribe. So they don't have a text, um, and they're going to just do this live um, in advance. So first, thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you to, to everyone assembled here, because I, I don't think uh, any of this is possible without the, the care for listening. And we, we honor that effort. Um, and at the same time, I mean, we also know that we wouldn't be here without uh, comrades who are struggling and uh, sacrificing everything um, all over the world, fighting uh, these forces of death. And uh, I really want to honor those people um, who make it all possible for us to even imagine uh, what, what it is we're fighting for, uh, reclaiming, because without that, that fight itself, uh, there isn't much space for imagination. So, yeah. So we're, we're a very small, we're a very small little fragment of the universe, but also vis-a-vis -vis that, that level of uh, sacrifice, we, we understand where we are in that order of things, and we're still quite small. So uh, a big respect to, to those who we don't see, but make this space possible for us to, to imagine what we're reclaiming and struggling for. So that's a... I think I say that for all of, all of the people who've been invited to speak. Um, we're here to talk about art in relation to resistance um, and struggle. And I, I'm not sure if it's at the origin, but we're going to try to make actually an argument of, of its importance uh, in, in all respects, including archaeology uh, of, of uh, older, what we could call art. Um, we thought as a way to warm up the space, we, we just thought it right now, that, that we would uh, begin with biographical notes, since ours were so swervy, um, in relation to art. And uh, I, I actually will break the rule of one story and just share two stories. Um, the, the first one being that when I uh, came as a child from Iran to, the, to Los Angeles, via Athens, um, I didn't know how to speak English. And my first way of making friends was to make drawings. And um, maybe these are more not to be explained, but they're fragments and images of thinking about whatever is the force of art or what we call art. The second is a uh, later, some years later, when I was now speaking English, an English teacher assigned us to um, read a, a book and write a report. And it has maybe something to do with us and, and today. We were assigned something, like we were going to produce a paper, and they were going to have it in advance. And somehow, art is, is always uh, disturbing the assignment. And so in this case, we asked our teacher, uh, a friend of mine had a video camera, and we asked him, could we make a video about the book? And uh, it was great fun. I, I, I'm sure that I would never remember even the name of that book, Red Sky at Morning. But uh, I remember it because we made a film, because there's everything else from childhood, that period, I hardly remember anything that we read, that we had to do. But I really remember that because we had to play the role of women, and there was cross-dressing. Our, our teacher was queer, but not explicitly. So of course, for him, it was liberating. Uh, we were playing with gender. We were playing with each other. We were um, kind of allowing a space of, of uh, and exploring a kind of freedom 
where we would make our own assignment. And uh, rather than be given a task, we were making it pleasurable and desirable. And that's, those are just two prefatory biographical notes about art and its kind of capacities. We'll, we'll try to continue to map out uh, some, some possibilities. Renee just asked me to do this, a uh, biographical note related to art. Uh, when I was studying um, in, in Berlin, I was studying officially architecture. And actually somebody told me, uh, oh, you have to look uh, at this as very interesting artist. So I looked at this book and I was trying to read and understand. And the artist's name was Marcel Duchamp. And um, so it was something hard to grasp. And uh, so over time, I understood that that kind of note, look at this book, affected me. And maybe a few things to say what um, was interesting about uh, um, this artist is, one is uh, a kind of uh, not, not taking art too seriously and not taking the idea of work uh, as serious. So there's a kind of, uh, within this being artist, uh, a kind of a critique of work, which I felt something close to. The other idea was this complexity of understanding, um, because sometimes one thinks like, oh, you have to be uh, approaching, as an artist, approaching a public so they need to understand. and. And uh, Duchamp was the opposite of that. So with time, I understood that actually the intuition is that this complexity can be also a kind of a protection against commodification. I can't say that he's not com commodified now, but if we enter a kind of a perspective of the artist as a maker and not as a kind of... Uh, uh, giving to an audience that is passive, that everybody can be taking that pers perspective of the making, then it's a different world we can live in. The other one, uh, I mean, um, I think that's part of it, because we were talking about the, the kind of uh, taking over even notions of decolonial feminism and uh, a lot of things, you know, in, with the comrades from um, Colombia and Argentina. So it's interesting to think about a complexity that is nourishing the struggle also. So, I mean, I know it's a little bit uh, strange to t tell the story here in this space, but uh, especially thinking of work and the notion of class and working class and how like that kind of uh, horizon relate, relate to the critique of work, you know? Okay, that's a story. I don't know if it's... So, yeah. so that was a preface. So the introduction. Every theory is a practice. Every practice is a theory. Their separation, if there is one, implies two theories one avowed and one practiced, one which is unconscious. Art could be described as a, as a practice that tries to live its theory, to, to make, uh, to put into practice a theory. So it can be for us not a rarefied space that by rarefied I mean just something some people do. Um, and, and so what is said, how it is done, form and the content are not separate for, for within that space of whatever we call art. And so in that sense, rather than seeing it as something, a, a group of professionals, and we'll come back to this in, in other moments today, but it, it, rather than see art as something that a rare group of people do, we want to liberate it from that and see it as a, as a quality, as a, as a practice that allows for a kind of a, a, a making, embodying a th theories. 
and a space for connecting what you feel, what you think, and how you do something and what you do. And uh, so it, it, is a, it is a kind of practice of, of, of freeing. Uh, that, that hard separation that I think um, the reality that we're forced into, we can call it colonial realities, patriarchal realities, capitalist realities that uh, keep severing the, that, that uh, intimate connection and making us think that actually there isn't a theory behind whatever practice we, we, are, we are doing. Um, so that would be a kind of introduction and thus also the form that this is going to take, not to overpromise, but maybe it already is underway, is, is trying to break a little bit that kind of rigidity of, of, a, of a lecture and try to find within it some space of play. So I hope that we can enlist your, uh, I don't like the word participation, but somehow presence in that. Um, second introduction. Second introduction, okay. Well, that same artist um, ha had a work in 1927 in, uh, in an apartment and it's called Door in 11 uh, uh, Rue Larry. So it's a door. And actually, an image uh, came to me before this uh, example. This example came after. And, and this image is the image of a hinge. The hinge is, you know, what connects and opens and closes the door. And so the, the short description of this work the door is operated between two adjacent rooms. When it opens in one direction, it is closed in another, a condition by which the room is never fully independent from the adjacent spaces. Thus, ambiguity between what is seen, what is unseen. So why this this is interesting in relation to what we are talking about. Um, let's say the room is art and life is the adjacent rooms always. And so this hinge that is connected to the door is going between the two. So in a way, art cannot be fully enclosed in one room. All the becoming of a life, the being with, the call of the common is what we define in this moment as a life, is connected to that art. So we cannot enclose life from art, we cannot enclose art from life as artists. They need to always be having this hinge and this relation of opening. And so, unfortunately, this becoming, this call, the common, has attacks on it, has the active forces against it, against life. And, and thus, the revolutionary movement has to come as a result of that, to defend this life. And so, this revolutionary movement is against those reactive forces. And I mean, however, this, uh, at the origin, the revolutionary movement is an affirmative movement. It wants to affirm a life. And what we saw in all these panels basically is a testimony to that, no? There is the, the earth, the abundance, uh, the plants, the sky, the, Everything there is, is about abundance, is about transformation, becoming together. However, all the reactive forces are about mining, controlling, uh, depriving life from its livelihood and from its becoming, from commoning, from being together. And this is the meaning of the revolutionary mo movement somehow. Oftentimes it has to defend the life that is actually should be there 
and we don't need to be constantly defending it, but this is the life we live in a way. So on, on many uh, levels, there's attacks on this life. Also, you know, the state, capital, uh, you know, certain metaphysical thinking, religions, uh, and their institutions, the schools, the university, the family, the church, the army, and the prisons and the camps, they all create figures of, you know, the, the, the priest, the soldier, the citizen, the intern, the migrant, and, um, and also the field of specialization, of work, of compensation through money, and all the professions. So it's all kind of, for us as artists, we need to kind of consider that door that opens whenever we, let's say the art, we can go to the art, what is this art? Okay, the, it could be uh, um, painting, drawing, taking notes, sculpting, but also cooking and thinking, dancing, cleaning, learning. We don't distinguish necessarily, but all this for it, uh, um, we have to always not feel that this is enclosed because then it's oppressive. If that act of painting is enclosed and this door is enclosed in a just its own uh, building, like the museum alone is itself something self-sufficient, then it becomes more part of these reactive forces then it supports all these things in life that we actually as revolutionaries, I mean, I speak now as a, as a way of mode of speaking, that those forces becomes a, a kind of reactive against our, what we wanted to do as artists, no? So that is in a way an attempt to start a, a conversation between art and its relation and how it, one can think the revolutionary movement uh, with art. Okay. Um, this is the closest to the lecture form. I think we will come. We will read. What can art say, unsay, do, undo in these precarious and yet precious times? We generally prefer to speak in between the others, and we are trying always to listen, thus weave with and through the words of others, the thoughts with others. But here we are asked and given the responsibility to speak, not necessarily in our own voice, since we are all carrying the voices of our community's ancestors. But we have been invited to give a voice, to take up a voice. If this voice then speaks or carries any weight, the, the section is called with what, with which voice we're speaking with, in, in what voice does one speak when one speaks? If this voice then speaks or carries any weight, any force and desire, it is from and with and for a communal. And we know that in communal efforts and struggles, sometimes we are forced to take up and more often than not given the responsibility to disseminate on occasion, to spread, to share the news, the experiences, the questions which particular struggles, particular experiences have borne. So before one speaks, it is critical to share where a voice is situated, positioned, where one stands. And it is largely from this situatedness that these reflections that we're sharing, questions on art and its potentialities are being shared tonight. For the sake of brevity, we will say that in terms of our standing, one foot has been placed in city life, already at a distance from the life-giving and generating forces of Earth. 
It is, has been the site, whether in Tehran, Athens, Bethlehem, uh, Berlin, New York, um, other, other places, all cities we have lived in, inhabited, where modernity, settler coloniality, coloniality, imperial, metropolitan fantasies have been established, fostered, constructed. Another foot has been in the communal, in the pockets, borders, ghettos, margins, where modes of resistance, survival, and life-giving forces have been developed and maintained. These spaces of resilience and of hope have been self-organized and relied on everyday forms of solidarity and what our good friend David Graeber called everyday communism. They survive largely in antagonism to the logic of capital, but they are not immune to its subversions and destructions. At first, these spaces of autonomy have been largely based on ancestral and familial ties, which many here will um, relate to, bonds, experiences, and these have by and large been shaped by rural, village, internalized, incorporated, incorporealized village communal life. In our cases, in Armenian life in Iran, Palestinian life in occupied Palestine. Later, this communal autonomy has been forced by a more intentional search to create in the heart of the alienated metropole of one of today's capitals for capital, Wall Street, just two blocks below, uh, one of which is actually Wall Street is one of the frontiers of the colonization of Turtle Island, um, what is called today Manhattan, New York City. There with many friends, two blocks below at 16 Beaver Street, we found a space to search for, recover, retrieve a language, to speak, think, weave different struggles for life against the forces, machines, factories, producing, developing sadness, waste, pollution, destruction, death. So I'm trying to situate that this space as, as critical, first the communal spaces of autonomy and this space that we've been involved in and, and this voice that speaks is not speaking as an individual anymore, but a carrier of these, these histories of, of conversations. Uh, so I continue. We have, without any funding or personal fortune or wealth, managed to liberate, to maintain an autonomous space, to find a common sense of our worlds and a sense to our worlds in common. We have cooked, read, seminared, occupied, thought, debated, watched, discussed, hosted, visited, marched, sang, danced, listened, shared, studied, struggled, learned, and unlearned, and organized hundreds of encounters, assemblies with friends and comrades from across the planet. We have searched with all those friends in open processes for now almost 25 years, 16 of those in this space of self-organization located at 16 Beaver Street. When we initiated that space in 1999, we could only dream of an anti-capitalist, anti-racist, anti-patriarchal, horizontal, anti-authoritarian movement to occupy Wall Street. We were then just still attempting to determine the grammar and sense of the movements and horizons, the alliances, the affinities, forces and histories that would have to form to come together to conjoin in order for something like such an experience, an event to take shape. Saying all of this does not in any way take away from the surprise or miraculous quality that this or any uprising, I'm now referring to the occupation of Wall Street, 
revolt, political rupture holds. It is only to acknowledge and give value to a largely hidden, subterranean, ongoing process that a community of artists, thinkers, writers, politically oriented, active people could help bring to life and hold and host, help realize, to act in solidarity directly where we may be was the idea. As a direct lesson from our compañeras and compañeros in Chiapas, to rather than relocate ourselves to Tunisia or Egypt, Yemen, Bahrain, Syria, where these revolutionary imaginaries emerged in late 2010 and 11, to extend the front and grammar, vocabulary of our struggles, and to do where we were, where we stood, naming our adversary, which became politically the 1%. This refuge space, this movement space, this learning space, this healing space, this nourishing space, this common space, we held together with and through what we call art. But we did this also intuiting and seeing the dominant spaces for teaching, studying, perceiving, exhibiting, collecting, commodifying, objectifying, colonizing, incarcerating, imprisoning, domesticating, cooling, freezing, fixing art to a form or forms, or even a search for forms, general or unique forms, that those existing institutions for art, given their colonial, racial, patriarchal, supremacist origins, would never allow such an experience of art to breathe yet again flourish. So it is from this rich communal space and process that has been held together with many friends from which we say and we saw an immense political and insurgent imaginary unfold. And it is through this very intense and real uh, experience from which to which we give voice. And all the history books of art and all the critics and historians of art, nor the museums or universities could ever teach us or give us anything like this experience. Okay. We play the game we we play the game of lecture and clapping. It worked. It was like a lecture. So we'll break that and uh so Irene uh, second part is um with with which voice? Oh, is it? Mhm. Mm mm -hmm. So from from where do we speak? I mean, from where do we speak was me? With which voice is it? I think uh, the question of language is also interesting. Um, it's something to be aware of sometimes when things in relation to language. Um, because a monster can be inhabiting language, can start speaking through us, and so in a way, art, literature, poetry is a is a place for for X kind of uh, X. What is the word for this uh, kind of get out the spirits? Uh, Exorcism. Exor exorcise those in in language in a way. So so to open language and also. Um, maybe we can try without too much kind of talking theoretical about language uh, to, to break it maybe into uh, a voice, a sound, so we think of this as an instrument and maybe we uh, use it as a different kind of uh, equipment, something, uh, instrument. In this moment, we could use that together and, and think of a kind of a, 
uh, energy and uh, momentum and uh, thoughts and wishes and to our comrades in, uh, let's say, we can make a voice uh, or, or a sound. Even we can break the, the, the language, uh, break it completely from being a voice into a sound and, and uh, the question of, of listening. And, and sending that kind of energy maybe to, to Kurdistan, to where all the comrades need that energy. So thinking of them, maybe we can propose a, a kind of a, a short one minute exercise that we can do together, that each of us can, can make that sound, voice, or something that you can hold for one minute, all of us together, and uh, see that, what can come out of this? Do you want to comment about how? Uh, yeah. I think that we, we will try an exercise now just to kind of open the space and prepare the space for the conversation to emerge that we try just for one minute to uh, each find a sound to create uh, that we could hold for one minute and uh, to think that through this collective uh, process, we will generate some energetic uh, transmission to our comrades in struggle. So it's just a, a space to, to find that sound together. And so we w maybe you will just get mark a beginning and an end. Maybe we give some time for folks to feel into it before we start. They like to close eyes. Is it also yeah. possible? No, no, go ahead. If you would like to close your eyes, it's also possible, but it's not required. If it makes you feel, um, yeah, we can count 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, Three, two, one. That was almost two minutes. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, part th 
three was that actually. This is part four. It, the heading is everyone, every one of us is a defeated artist. So this thought has come through thinking about art in a more expanded form. So um, we don't see art as a profession, although certainly there are such professionals as there are many others. For us, art is a basic quality, a capacity, or means all beings have to nourish, to discover, to find a relation to their calling, to what makes them feel happy, to find, make life meaningful, to reach a potentiality, to create, to search for buen vivir, to put to question what they, we, how we do, to put to question the means by which we do or undo any task or doing, to find another way of doing things more meaningfully, more desirably, questioning meaning, questioning desire. Art is the means by which we can put the means and ends constantly in question, and that's a very critical dimension of our struggles. Art is not a, a field where some professionals make art for us. It's a basic capacity that needs to be nourished in the, in, in, in a, as a practice which allows us to put those means and the, the ends always into question. And that's why it's such a generative and, and nourishing part of struggle. Um, it's the basic ability to shape life, to form life, um, to find a, another way of doing things. And it is um, the plasticity of our existence. So we mentioned uh, our, our, our friend David and uh, in the dawn of everything, I think this is a big theme with David Wengro, David Graeber explores this this, this question of why we're, we're in this rut where we, it seems that we can't change or create, renew our conditions of life. And we see art as a, as a, as a necessary space for playing with the form uh, of life. So, um, yeah, maybe, maybe that's, uh, it's, it's, maybe it's also important to say that by sequestering art to a given form or worse to assigned chosen individuals, we have delimited and deprived people of their basic means of freedom. Um, but this is not freedom as an abstract concept, it is freedom in its concrete practice. To play with and alter reality to remove or remake the rules, not to avoid the game, as like a, the assignment that I, I was giving as an example of the teacher, but to make it more interesting, the game. And um, so I think it ha also has a very inherent relation to play. And um, because play is also this dimension that basically allows us to really um, take something that's fixed and, um, and give it another kind of possibility, a common use. A friend of ours talks about the inherent dimension of play being um, like children's games often take sacred rituals and profane them, something that would be untouchable and that they give it, uh, they can play with those rights but they, they, they open the space to change the conditions and see it from another perspective. And I was thinking of this time we were in Palestine uh, driving to a weekly protest in Belin where uh, the community actually every week was doing an, uh, something like an artistic practice, which every week they did some kind of uh, artistic act uh, the, the week we had gone that week, they had constructed a wall 
and then they were taking it and they were contesting the wall, which was going to take their lands. And so they built a wall and they carried the wall and then the Israeli soldiers destroyed the wall. <laughs> so it was a beautiful act and, uh, of, of aesthetic kind of resistance and they were actually one of the few communities that have succeeded to stop the wall from taking their land, which they did um, with a lot of efforts from the international solidarity movement. But before arriving to that protest, we saw a couple of kids and they were, um, it was incredible. At that time, all the roads were blocked full of checkpoints and nobody could drive and only people with international passports. And we saw these kids playing a game of checkpoint with each other and interchanging their roles. Like one was being the Israeli soldier capturing the, the child that was throwing stones with a kind of wooden gun yeah. that they had made and then patting him down and doing all the gestures of the checkpoint. And then suddenly the other child would take that role and by, by playing with this kind of ritual of security, they were disactivating in a way the, the violence that they're subjected to and giving themselves some space of, of freedom, of profaning this sacred security of a state and, and no longer being victims of that. You know? and, and so it's a basic quality that, that art is, is, a, is a space of play to break and, and allow for plasticity of our everyday conditions. And the more we can allow that practice not to be enclosed, which I think the modern colonial kind of uh, capitalist world does and, and puts it in this space of, called the museum, but, but see it as an everyday practice that we all uh, is deprived of us, except in childhood maybe, that, that we need to restore that as an everyday dimension of the struggle uh, for, for creating and like a daily practice of freedom I think is, is, a, is for us a way of trying to see, see, it, see it and maybe I'll conclude maybe uh, for now to open up the space, but it is a, my part and maybe Irene you have some final remark. Uh, we took our time I think um, after you. So it's critical I think for us to recall that every dance, every beat, w what we heard today uh, earlier I mean, rather than see them in this kind of a commodified form that is like virtuoso, that it arrives to us as like p only certain people can dance, only certain people can play music. It, it's each of these gestures is very vernacular. It comes from people. It doesn't come from professionals. All the songs have been invented by us. And, and I think we, to, to, to recall every, every dance, every song, every beat, every sound we make, it has this deep memory of a, of a life which is calling, which is ancestral, which is here, and it, and it retains within it this potency and this desiring to make and unmake um, our worlds. And, and I think um, that's, that's my kind of concluding note, I and mean, we have a lot more prepared, but we should, we should discuss, but Irene, maybe the last part, and yeah. Should I? Maybe, I actually one, um, I would like to relate to two things that came up today and yesterday. Uh, I think James yesterday was saying, well, we have to distinguish between the state and the people, not to mix up the state and the people, and understand that the state is oppressive, meanwhile the people are a different story. That's one. The other, what Azra was asking in a very touching uh, manner is, let me see what I wrote, not to hope, but to believe and uh, why, if the poor or the impoverished can uh, live with very uh, little means and fight, why can't others, why can't we all do it? And so this is a question about uh, 
of who we think we are or, and how we become who we are. So is it true that the state and what it kind of produces as in the name of the, their uh, legalisms, the citizen, their, is it a completely different thing? Or how do they relate to, to this making of that citizen that can start to identify with, uh, with what, what it forms? Basically, we are a kind of a formation, and each moment we are constantly changing and forming. And so we, are, we have different forces acting on us. And, and so this question of basically of Azra is like, why, why do we accept to be uh, in, in cities as walking cash machines, right? We are constantly working and, and paying. You walk a few distances and you have to pay to take the bus, you have to pay to do this, you have to pay, you have to work to get the money, you have to work. And so, in a way, that forms us. That's the outside that is basically folding on us. So the, the other image is this fold. There is the hinge, which, you know, the door and the hinge and maybe a window to an outside rather than a frame. But here is an image of a fold that is kind of forming through an outside someone. And it can be something that is desirable, but most of the time it's also monstrous what, what is being pro produced through the, the states. We are basically produced in factories. The university is a factory, uh, the schools are factories, the family is another factory. And so what kind of uh, uh, production is that? And how can we resist that production? And that's why the state and the people Basically, they have to de-something themselves. If, they, if it's a colonial state, they have to decolonize themselves. But it's not a big scale. It's something also on another level. I understand what James is saying on a bigger scale, but on another scale, but it's not only a scale issue. It's a manner and the way that these forces enter us. It's the television, the phone, the internet today. I mean, everything is there to form us. It's not to inform, to form. And so, in a way, it's something that is crucial to the struggle. And maybe art is, for us, part of that. The image, text, the relation of image, text. So if we are artists, we have to, what we feel is also part of this form, formation, is to think in the widest sense about this and how we can resist it. And also, how can we bring desirable, desirable folds into our lives? And I think a lot of younger uh, um, folks, friends, are, are attracted to the uh, Kurdish struggle because it's an amazing fold, possibly. Because otherwise, the other folds are banalization of life. That's why there's a lot of depression, there's a lot of suicide in, in let's say, the, the modern world that we uh, witness. So it is not only personal. Those so-called personal issues are also political, but they also manifest themselves as kind of forces that come from the outside. So in a way, to kind of see how we can, uh, um, yeah, Fold, yeah, fold and, and uh, in a different way. And, uh, and also, this is a process to be done together. And that's why when we are together, the forces are more uh, beautiful because we, we know that this is a kind of a forming we are creating, but it's a desirable one. It's not a commodification one. And it's not about uh, networking or creating a career or all this kind of industrial uh, equipment that people usually go to the conference to kind of network, find a job, or uh, promote oneself, and all this kind of objectification of oneself, finally. And so, I know, we can uh, maybe stop here for a moment. So, the last, yeah. <laughs> you want to give the word. I think, I think before we, so we, we will, move to questions, that was the point. 
But maybe as a last exercise and keeping the, the, the concentration, many people have in their bags a, a, a notebook with a pen and a paper. And apropos fold, we, we were thinking it would be great just to take a moment, each person, it will mean a lot to us, but I think also the organizers, if we just take one or two minutes, and in that time maybe we can just leave the space for a conversation to come, to just write a question that is close to your heart in this moment, something very that, that, that is staying with you. Maybe a few of you will have the sense to share it publicly, but if you don't, we would love to have that folded sheet of paper uh, up here on the stage, and we will collect that and maybe, maybe work with that some more. I, it's not a feedback uh, in that general sense. It's, it's just a question uh, that is close to you in this moment. So uh, something that allows us to also perceive later on who was here and to, to leave also an impression for us and, and the organizers it will be very, very special. If, if you will all, all do that. Just so to just take a couple of minutes, one minute, and maybe in that time, uh, if you wanted to, sure. yeah. And if you need paper, you can <laughs> we can pass this around. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I've, th there's such a rich range of connections and ideas and undoings. Um, I just want to reflect back um, a little bit on some of the connections that I see from the previous panel into um, the conversation uh, here. And I think it was Barry who mentioned um, the unlearning that we have to do, the, uh, the ways um, we have internalized capitalist modernity and the importance of unlearning and undoing. And I think that's one of the main reasons you know, thinking about art and aesthetics and the arrangement of our senses and how we experience the world, um, the life around us, our relationships to each other, um, they're so heavily colonized. Um, and you know, it's, it's precisely in the gestures or in the movements or in the feelings that we might not even be aware of that you know, it penetrates at the most insidious level. And the, so this work of unlearning, this work of rearrangement, this, this opening, um, I think is really, really crucial. And um, I think it also relates to what Nazan was talking about at the, at the very end about the sort of, there, there never being a single thing I don't know if I'm paraphrasing. I apologize if I get the quote wrong. But yeah. Um, and this idea of breaking away from categories, from divisions um, that are predetermined, that are both um, oppressive, but also at some uh, not so good level comfortable because it's what we know, right? Um, and that, that line of um, you know, that risk taking, that, that moment when you can take flight and go a different direction or do something different um, that can open up um, a whole range of possibilities, right? And I think that in some ways, one of the things I think about it, in relationship to this problem is our relationship to the unknown, like un our relationship to what's not familiar or what, what we don't know or what we can't know. Um, and I think that this, this space of play, uh, of curiosity, of discovery, it's, it's very, when it's circumscribed um, for us as children, you know, it has, it, 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 it's, it's, to a certain degree, allowable. Um, and it's something that we don't really have access to as we get older. And um, so I, I kind of, 
um, making these connections, but hopefully trying to formulate it into a question that, that all three of you can entertain. Um, and this relationship to um, that which we don't know, I'm thinking, David, in terms of your work, um, the sort of the relationship to myth and the sort of the reclaiming of certain heritages, right, that are, that, that are about decommodifying them, right? Um, and, and I think that, wor that, that shift, if you can maybe think about, I don't know, and if it's too much of a stretch, it's cool. Um, how this 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 idea of um, you know a way of relating to a particular history that is, is is not yet knowable or not known or that leaves room for these other stories um, to be uh, to be excavated in some way, right? Um, that might be an interesting point to think about in relationship to. Um, yeah, these openings and these notions of play, and I think just the same invitation um, to Irene and Renee in terms of how you think about, um, you know, this this relationship when you're when you're doing your work in collective spaces, right? How do you negotiate that when you're trying to create something in a collective way um, that is taking us elsewhere? And at some point, as you all are writing your questions, I would love to know if there, maybe there can be a reflection moment about how you all experienced the music that we co-created for two minutes, uh, how that felt for folks. <laughs> I'll just jump in, maybe Irene and David want to add something. I mean, because I, that first part where I was reading a longer text, I mean, basically, if we think about it, like what's happening in Rojava is very much for us, not only uh, obviously based on a, a longer arc of struggle and, you know, s centuries of, resistance, but in the shorter history connected to whatever we were thinking about in New York at that time to, to act in solidarity with the uprisings throughout North Africa and uh, including in Syria. And, uh, and I think, you know, just to imagine a, sp a space that is organized by artists, uh, what I was describing, could, could be part of that struggle, could, uh, could, could host in a way um, among uh, the various forces that came together in that time, the occupation of Wall Street with many different friends and comrades that had for years frequented that space um, is, is a kind of a, I think a very important testament to the force that whatever that we're trying to describe that isn't a, like a objectified object-based art, but just that space of art could, could be part of that struggle. I think it's a very hard thing to connect guerrilla struggle and something in, in a very distant place in, in the heart of capital that is a group of people meeting for years also carrying within, within them histories. And so there is a basic question about the infrastructures, the social infrastructures of, let's say, supremacy, of capitalist class supremacy, white supremacy, coloniality, the museums, the, the universities, all those structures that are largely shaped and continue to be shaped by those interests and those histories of supremacy. And, and so, I think creating and self-organizing our own spaces and committing to those, including learning, because we really need to learn our way 
out of this, this trap we're in and inventing these, these more plastic spaces that we can shape and think together, find a new language, is, is what I, I, I think we, we, we can walk away in this session thinking more about this, the, the force of it because everything around us is made to, to capture it, uh, commodify it, or to say that it, it's, it's impotent and it's just a group of people meeting and talking about and not acting. And yet, we, there is a, I, I'm just here to like bring that news that a community that commits to thinking together over a period of time can find those moments to act also together and create even a very viral force and, and uh, to not under estimate our capacities and and even uh, if space if a sp if the space of art can do that and I think what is interesting with David your your contribution is is trying to imagine what kind of infrastructures mm -hmm. we 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 need in 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 disembedding ourselves from those institutions that tend to reify uh, and uh, reproduce a kind the world that we're, we're that destroys all worlds finally, that destroys the multiplicity and difference uh, that we're trying to affirm. So we could be, for instance, in Palestine or Rojava or uh, uh, you know, and trying to say, well, we're going to resist the the occupation and we're going to create our own museum, but the form of the museum is the same colonial form uh, that that is part of the apparatus of oppression. And so just changing the content won't liberate us. So we, we have to, that's where this kind of form and content have to be reimagined re, re and, and maybe recovered also. Uh, because largely, I would say most of the colonized peoples of the world have maintained those, those cultures in the homes and in everyday practices, not in museums. And so how do we, when, when we do fight for our liberation, uh, you know, even in the liberated zones when we practice archaeology, how do we preserve that heritage and not make a kind of new sacred order or uh, a new space of separation? So some...